Uh, welcome everyone to our GI knowledge sessions. These are a series of talks and seminars about gemology that are fueled by our decades of research. And it's our mission to share all of our learnings with you. So uh, I'm really excited to kick things off today. I'm Kelly Giordano, a member of the content team here at GIA. And I'm joined by Akira Hyatt, senior staff gemologist at GIA. And she's gonna give us an in-depth look at the GIA seven pearl value factors. So before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. Everyone attending this is automatically on mute. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to ask questions as you go. And there will be a Q&A session at the end where Akira will answer as many questions as we can get to. Uh, we'll also send a recording of the session to you later today by email. So uh, take a look, uh, you know, keep an eye out for that. But that email will also include a survey and we would love to hear your feedback. So with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Kira. Thanks, Kelly. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Akira Hyatt, and I have been working with pearls at the GIA for over 20 years. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk to you about pearl classification, uh, which broadly is the evaluation and description of the visual characteristics of pearls. Um, earlier this year, Chunwei Zhao <clears throat> discussed the identification of pearls, which pertains mainly to the internal characteristic, although there are some superficial aspects of pearls that are addressed in identification as well. Uh, nacreous pearls can and do occur naturally in a wide range of appearances in terms of their size, shape, color, and surface conditions. These variations in appearance are primarily determined by the pearl types and their inherent differences. This talk will address how to accurately and consistently evaluate, separate, and describe pearls according to those differences. A couple of notes regarding terminology and usage throughout this talk. Uh, when I talk about pearls and use the term pearl without qualification, in this talk I'm referring to nacreous cultured pearls. Uh, when I do mention natural pearls, I will refer to them as such. And uh, additionally, matching always only applies to two or more pearls. It's not applicable for single pearls. When most people hear the word pearl, a small round white pearl springs to mind. However, the appearance of nacreous pearls varies widely with much broader range than most people realize. While certain colors are predominant for each of the nacreous pearl types, virtually any color of the spectrum can and does occur naturally, with the exception of reds, which we'll discuss more later. Furthermore, sizes, shapes, and surfaces vary greatly as well. In order to discuss and sort pearls in a useful and meaningful way, <clears throat> it is imperative that one employs a consistent method of evaluating, separating, and describing pearls to differentiate between their various appearances. Farms need a way to separate their harvests. Sellers and buyers need a way to identify differences in lots. Jewelers need ways to identify particular visual characteristics to complement a design. Dealers need a way to categorize their inventory and retail customers need a way to understand the appearance and quality of the pearls they consider and ultimately purchase. There are a number of classification systems in existence, with the AAA system being the most well known. However, some systems are difficult to decipher and many are specific to individual company, which makes them useful, less useful for wide ranging reliable classification or consistent description. Today, we'll be explaining the GIA's pearl classification system, which we apply to the nacreous cultured pearls submitted to the GIA laboratories worldwide. Um, also, at the end of today's talk, I will give a sneak peek at a new cultured pearl classification report debuting this fall. So what is pearl classification? Pearl classification is any methodical system for consistently evaluating and describing pearls according to their external characteristics. The GIA evaluates seven different attributes when classifying pearls, and those are size, shape, color, which includes overtone and orient, luster, surface, and matching. Collectively, these comprise the GIA seven pearl value factors. 
Uh, pearl classification is often likened to diamond grading, but given the complex nature of uh, pearls, the classification tends to be uh, a little bit more nuanced. Um, for example, with pearls, color is not simply a function of presence or saturation as it is with D to Z diamond grading, but also hue, tone, overtone, and orient. Um, while symmetrical pearls are typically more valuable than asymmetrical pearls, high quality broke pearls can e <clears throat> command equally high prices as comparable symmetrical pearls. And luster ranges differ from one type of pearl to another, so an excellent luster is not the same across the board. Those are just some of the subtle differences that must be accounted for when classifying pearls. Those subtleties necessitate a classification system that allows and accounts for the inherent fluidity of pearls, <clears throat> their characteristics, and their appearances. And that is precisely what the GIA seven pearl value factors system is designed to do. While the GIA is primarily known for the four C's diamond grading system, it also has a long history with pearls. In fact, the GIA began offering pearl identification services in 1949 few years before the introduction of the Four Cs and its diamond grading services. Pictured are a couple of examples of early gems and gemology articles about pearls, their attributes, classification, value, all as it relates to the pearl market. The 1942 two-part article on the left by Paul Wrights <coughs> focuses primarily on natural pearls while the 1967 article on the right by Richard Liddicote uh, <clears throat> goes into deep detail about the processes of pearl farming and pearl classification, mainly for Akoya pearls. Although the success of GIA's diamond grading system has overshadowed some of its other work, pearl identification and classification was a very important part of GIA's <clears throat> early gemological work. GIA's history with pearl classification specifically stretches back to 1967 when Richard Liddicote identified seven different pearl value factors developing GIA's first systematic method for consistently evaluating and describing the visual characteristics and qualities of pearls. Those factors were and are size, shape, color, luster, nacre, surface, and matching. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Liddicote's system was developed to be used in GIA's new, at the time, Pearls course that debuted soon after the article was published. Uh, additionally, Pearl classification was developed in part out of a necessity to consistently evaluate and describe the increasingly available and popular Akoya pearls, which had become a staple in the jewelry market at that time, at least in America. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Liddicote's system is the cornerstone of the pearl classification system that GIA uses today, with the exception of some refinements, including the development of comprehensive master sets and expansion to include the newer types of pearls or that have become popular um, and some terminology modifications, the system remains much the same. Uh, GIA still uses established master sets to classify pearls and straightforward language to describe the seven value factors. The GIA's unique pearl classification system um, is unusual in that it compares like to like in terms of pearl types. So Akoya pearls are compared to Akoya masters, Tahitians to Tahitian masters, and South Sea to South Sea masters. <clears throat> GIA employs different masters and different parameters for each of the different types of pearls to reflect the inherent differences between the types. So in addition to having the separate masters, the grades themselves uh, vary a little bit from type to type because different types of pearls um, have naturally different ranges for things like luster or shape or surface. <coughs> Sorry. 
GI's extensive collection of master pearls for hue, tone, body color, luster, surface, and matching, as well as references for overtone, orient, and nacre are unrivaled. The master pearl sets provide the framework for reliable consistency between GIA gemologists and the different GIA lab locations worldwide. Also, the GIA 7 Pearl Value Factor System is a comprehensive classification system that allows users to evaluate each of the individual factors independent of each other. <clears throat> this separation allows buyers and sellers to determine what combinations of qualities they prefer when buying and selling pearls. Some people prioritize luster, some surface, some quality. Um, this system allows buyers to pick and choose to find the combinations that best suit them, their brand, and their clients. GIA's pearl classification terminology is straightforward in that it uses common language to describe the various qualities as opposed to alphanumeric grades, which can be difficult to understand and decipher. Descriptions like very good luster, lightly spotted surface, <clears throat> or excellent matching are classifications that anyone can understand, even without knowing the exact parameters or the particulars of the GIA system. As these features, <clears throat> all of these features make the GIA 7 Pearl Value Factors classification system accessible to those within the pearl industry as well as retailers and their customers. The GIA 7 Pearl Value Factors classification system can be used to describe all nacreous pearls, including natural and freshwater pearls. However, currently the GIA masters and GIA classification reports are specifically <coughs> applied to the evaluation, description, and classification of cultured Akoya, South Sea, and Tahitian pearls. The most essential tool that the GIA employs in the consistent classification of masters is an unrivaled extensive set of master pearls. Um, pictured here are three of the different sets for three different labs. Um, and these are not complete sets. These are the um, what we call the boards. So this doesn't include the strands or the other reference pearls. Um, each GIA lab location that offers pearl services and reports has a matched master pearl set consisting of several hundred pearls. Each master set includes a hue circle, a neutral scale, three different tone and saturation grids, reference pearls for shape, overtone, orient, and nacre, and separate master strands for each of the different primary cultured pearl types for luster, surface, and matching. The separate pearl type strand sets guarantee that client pearls are being compared to the same type of master and that inaccurate parameters are not being applied to the pearls being classified. You cannot take uh, Akoya pearls and grade them using, Akoya, uh, using Tahitian strands um, because, as I said before, um, a number of the parameters are completely different. <clears throat> These master pearls ensure that not only are individual gemologists consistent with themselves and with each other, but that the individual GI labs are consistent with each other as well. And that's important because uh, for individual gemologists, you want to be consistent if you're looking at the same pearl a second time. Uh, you should be winding up with the same grade as you did the first time. Uh, and that goes for individual labs, if something comes into an individual lab, or if something goes from one lab to another lab, uh, the grades should remain the same regardless of where the classification is taking place. The second critical piece of equipment used at the GIA is the Judge to Light Box provide both a consistent light source and a neutral background. Historically, pearls were viewed in natural daylight. However, even natural daylight can shift dramatically based on location, the time of year, the time of day, and of course, the weather. So in addition to the master pearls, the GIA relies on a consistent classification environment to produce accurate and reliable results. 
To mitigate any shifts in lighting and or color appearance, GIA uses the gray tag Macbeth Judge 2 light box to classify pearls, as well as colored diamonds and colored stones. In addition to providing a clean, neutral gray background, the judge is outfitted with daylight equivalent bulbs, eliminating the variables encountered with sunlight. The judge is also very useful in establishing consistent viewing geometry and distances for evaluating pearls. Masters and client pearls are always placed in the same positions within the judge during classification. Viewing a strand four inches away from your face and one inch from a light source can produce very different results than viewing it from an 18 inch distance at eye level, which in a judge is generally six to eight inches below the light source. Without a consistent light source background and viewing conditions, even established pearl masters can appear very different from one viewing to the next. Now I will take you through each of the GIA seven pearl value factors uh, one by one. While some of the categories are more or less self-explanatory, others are more complicated. I will explain how the general terminology such as color and matching applies to pearls specifically and how the GIA defines the various classification designations uh, and specific terminology. <coughs> The first of the GIA seven pearl value factors is size. Pearl size is measured in millimeters to two decimal places and expressed as a diameter, uh, length by width or diameter, or length by width by depth. Uh, weight is also a function of pearl size uh, and it's measured in carats for loose or silk strong strands. Um, and it's measured in grams for uh, finished necklaces and other mounted jewelry or decorative items. Um, pearl size, like many factors, varies by pearl type. Um, freshwater and Akoya pearls tend to be on the smaller side, while Tahitian and South Sea pearls tend to fall on the larger side. Akoya pearls typically range from 5 to 9 millimeters, Tahitians from 9 to 16 millimeters, and South Sea from 9 to 18 millimeters. And freshwater pearls have the widest size range, frequently occurring anywhere from two to 18 millimeters. Um, while those are all the typical size ranges, any type of pearl can and uh, do occur in both smaller and larger sizes than their normal ranges. The uh, second GIA pearl value factor is shape. There are seven main pearl shapes round, near round, oval, drop, button, semi-baroque, and baroque. Um, and the pearl shapes are divided into two categories, symmetrical and asymmetrical. Uh, semi-baroque can be used in two ways. Uh, first, it can be used as a shape modifier um, in cases where uh, there's an identifiable shape that is somewhat asymmetrical. So for example, uh, a semi-baroque drop. Um, the second case is when you have, uh, sometimes with semi-baroque pearls, you have sort of a crossover of shapes. So something might be like an oval button, but slightly asymmetrical. So in that case, um, there are too many um, options. And so you can just call it a semi-baroque pearl. Um, Baroque pearls are pearls that are completely asymmetrical and do not have any identifiable outline. <clears throat> All the pearl types um, occur in the full range of shapes. Um, additionally, Chinese freshwater pearls are often beaded to produce specific geometrical or fanciful shapes such as rectangles or hearts and those can be described as they appear. The third GIA pearl value factor is color. Unlike size and shape, color is a bit more complicated and it, as it encompasses a number of components, particularly when it comes to pearls. Hue, tone, and saturation combine to determine a pearl's body color, which is the overall dominant color of a pearl or group of pearls. Body color descriptions can be further modified by the presence of overtone or orient. 
Hue is the general impression of color, such as yellow or green. Uh, GIA uses 19 different hue names. Um, and you can see the hue circle here in this slide. Um, and next to it is the neutral scale, uh, which is also a tone scale from light to dark on the vertical axis. axis. <clears throat> Both of these uh, masters, each is a master set, uh, a, part, a part of the master set, but uh, an independent part of the master set. Each of these are both used with all of the other pearls and pearl master boards. Um, you will see later that certain parts of our masters are only used for uh, specific pearls. <clears throat> uh, so as I said, tone is measured on the vertical axis as a relative lightness or darkness of color. And it ranges from white at the top, as you can see there on the screen, through the various grays, uh, which uh, can be light, uh, straight call, or a dark call, and then down to black. Um, saturation is measured on the horizontal axis as the relative weakness or strength of color. Um, it starts out at neutral uh, with no saturation. Um, and then it moves from very weak to strong uh, as it moves through a uh, color grid. <clears throat> Overtone is a single translucent color overlying a pearl's body color, while Orient is any combination of multiple overtone colors or surface iridescence overlying a pearl's color. While there is some overlap, the different cultured pearl types naturally segregate segregate along color boundaries, with Tahitian pearls occupying the cool hues, freshwater pearls, the reds and orange hues, and South Sea pearls occupying the yellow hues. And Akoya pearls tend to be white, as they are almost all bleached, but they can also be cream colored and rarely, when unbleached, silver or light bluish gray. Uh, the next aspect of color um, is tone and saturation. This slide shows the three different tone and saturation color grids, which are separated by hue, and uh, they are used to determine all of the GIA color classifications. On the left is the cool grid, which covers green, blue, and violet hues. Uh, this is the grid that is used to classify most Tahitian pearls. However, the darker pearls on the other two grids also display Tahitian pearls um, simply because they are the darkest of all the pearl types. Uh, in the center is the warm uh, pink orange grid, which covers pinkish purple, uh, red, and orange hues. Um, this grid is used uh, for most freshwater pearls. Uh, although some of the metallic freshwater pearls fall into the warm uh, yellow color range. Um, also, uh, some of the purplish Tahitian pearls will also be graded against uh, this uh, center board. <clears throat> On the right is the warm yellow grid, which is limited more or less to three hues, orangey yellow, yellow, and greenish yellow. This discrete range covers most of the South Sea pearls, although they rarely occur in the greenish yellow hue. And again, at the darker end of this uh, warm yellow grid, we uh, fall into um, a Tahitian pearl area in the darker browns. Um, so as I said before, there is some crossover, um, at least in the warm grids, uh, if not in the uh, cool grid. <clears throat> uh, as far as color goes in the low saturations, cool hues tend to appear grayish, um, while warm hues uh, and colors tend to appear brownish. So uh, when you would modify cool hues, generally you modify it with the term gray or grayish. So grayish green or grayish blue. 
Um, and when you're modifying the warm hues, you modify with brown or brownish. So it would be brownish pink or yellowish brown, um, for example. However, in the two areas where warm and cool hues transition into each other, which uh, are the um, hues of purple and green, um, colors can be modified with either gray or brown. Um, so you can have either purplish gray or purplish brown and either uh, greenish gray or greenish brown. Um, in this case only, only at those two transitional areas um, can you uh, swap the modification terms. Um, the appearance itself will tell you which term you need to use. So um, although you may have something that's fairly green and, you know, the rule is, is supposed to be that you would call it greenish gray or something like that, when you grade it out um, against the masters, uh, it just won't look correct. It will have a distinctly brownish appearance that you can't sort of uh, ignore. And so that would be a case where you switch the modifier to brown instead of gray. Uh, one other important note for color is that while red is used as a hue term for nacreous pearls, um, we do use it for, you know, uh, purplish red, red, uh, orangey red, uh, all for hue. Uh, it is not used as a body color classification term. We always use pink or pinkish as nacreous pearls never reach saturation levels that would be described as red. <coughs> Um, the last component of pearl color is overtone uh, and orient. One of the most distinctive and beautiful features of pearls is the presence of overtone or orient, which add an ethereal quality to their appearance. Overtones and orient uh, overlie a pearl's body color, adding another dimension of color that seems to float just above a pearl's surface. Overtone refers to a single translucent color overlying a pearl's body color, while orient refers to any combination of multiple colors or iridescence. <clears throat> Overtones are described using any of the straight hue names. We do not modify overtone calls. So for example, overtone would just be described as pink, not purplish pink, um, or green rather than bluish green. Um, this slide is a little fuzzy because I couldn't find the original image, um, but it um, illustrates some important uh, information about overtone. Um, so overtone is usually seen at the outer edge of a pearl um, appearing as a ring of color, uh, or it is uh, seen across the body of the pearl with the body color visible at the edges. So in this slide, in the lower um, section, the pearl on the right um, displays the outer ring of uh, overtone appearance. So if you look at it, the center of the pearl looks green. Um, the outer edge of the pearl has a pink overtone, fairly visible, um, probably more so if this were a little bit sharper. Um, and this pearl on the left shows pink overtone all throughout the center of the body. Um, it's a little difficult to see because of the arrows and because of how spread the overtone is, but in this case, you can see the body color at the edges of the pearl. So it sort of reverses, um, you know, you either have it uh, just as a ring at the outer edge or you have it across the body and the ring uh, at the outer edge in that case is the body color. Um, this pearl in the center uh, of that lower image uh, has no body color, uh, sorry, no overtone. So you can see the difference. It's, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, it is a sort of 
neutral cool color doesn't have the warmth that you see when there's a pink overtone. Uh, the image in the top shows you a progression of overtone strength from none uh, to very strong. So um, again, this is a Tahitian pearl with pink overtone, um, and we're starting at none, then very weak, weak, moderate, strong, and very strong all the way on the right. Um, in the lab, we would ignore none, obviously, but we would also ignore very weak um, because it is typically at a level where people struggle to see whether or not um, it's actually present. Um, and our approach is that if you are struggling to see it, then it is not callable. So we begin calling um, at around a weak level where it's not terribly strong, but it is uh, obvious um, to the viewer. Um, and just to clarify, we don't uh, we don't quantify um, in terms of overtone. We simply note its uh, presence or absence. We don't use terms like moderate or strong. <clears throat> um, While well, Tahitian pearls tend to display the widest range of colors and strongest overtones and orients, uh, both can be found on all types of pearls. Uh, freshwater pearls also have a wide range of overtone colors and strengths. South Sea pearls tend to display pink or green overtones or orient. And finally, Akoya pearls are almost all subject to processing to enhance their pink overtone. So GIA does not call it as it is not naturally occurring. The GIA, uh, well, let me start by saying, uh, because pearl color is such an intricate value factor, I made this little uh, crib sheet for the end of uh, talking about pearl color. Um, since it was a lot of information, this sort of uh, just takes it down to the main point. Um, the GIA seven pearl value factors pearl classification system describes <clears throat> pearl color using 19 hue names, the neutrals, which are white, gray, and black, the near neutrals, which are silver, cream, and brown. Um, hue is the general impression of color, whether something is red or yellow. Uh, tone is the relative lightness or darkness. Um, saturation is the relative weakness or strength. Body color is determined by hue, tone, and saturation, and it describes the overall color of a pearl or a group of pearls. Uh, overtone is a single overlying translucent color, while orient is multiple colors or iridescence. Um, and importantly, some of the color terms used in the GIA system match industry terms that are widely used and well-defined such as cream for light yellow to orange pearls and silver for light cool colors. Um, GIA does not use other industry terms that are more fanciful and less well-defined, such as aubergine, pistachio, peacock, and gold. Um, and again, red is used as a hue name, but not used as a body color classification term. Always use pink or pinkish, because nacreous pearls never reach saturation levels that would be described as red without being dyed. Uh, the fourth pearl value factor is luster. Luster is another feature of pearls that contributes, pardon me for a second, uh, to their unique and captivating appearance. Uh, luster describes the intensity and sharpness of reflections seen on a pearl surface. Um, the best way to evaluate luster is by examining the reflection of your light source, which often appears as a bright white light uh, band or spot at the upper edge of your pearl. So in, this, in these pearls, it would be sort of this area here uh, is your light source where it's most bright. Um, and it's likely that this dark area in the center is either some sort of um, boundary of a light box or um, it could be 
a reflection of um, part of the light source itself. In addition to using the reflection of the light source, you can also use the reflection of your light box if you're using one. You can use the reflections of your tweezers if you have them or your self. You can look at your face or your fingers and see how uh, sharp and clear they appear in the surface of a pearl. Um, the definitions for the various luster classifications are as follows. Excellent luster uh, has reflections that are bright, sharp, and distinct. Very good luster has reflections that are bright and near sharp. Good luster reflections are bright but not sharp. Fair luster reflections are weak, hazy, and blurred. And poor luster reflections are dim and diffuse. Um, often you can't see any reflection at all except for perhaps a very uh, faint fuzzy haze um, that's a bit lighter than the body of the pearl. Um, luster ranges vary by pearl type, uh, with the most notable variation being South Sea pearls, uh, which inherently possess a slightly softer but equally beautiful satiny luster appearance. The fifth pearl value factor is surface. Um, surface describes the degree of spotting of the surface of a pearl or group of pearls. Um, when classifying surface, you must take into account the size, nature, number, and location of blemishes. Um, for example, a Baroque pearl can be shown more leniency with blemishes than a symmetrical pearl, as small blemishes may be camouflaged by the often irregular surface of uh, Baroque pearls. Um, also, one large blemish may be equal to uh, numerous smaller blemishes. Um, in a strand, a blemish on a pearl near the clasp of a necklace is less severe uh, than one that would be central um, and facing front in a necklace. Uh, on a mounted item, a blemish near a drill hole or a mounting is going to be less visible than a blemish uh, on the face of a pearl. Uh, for mounted pearls, only the visible parts of a pearl will be classified and it will be given a face grade. Uh, for example, face clean or face moderately spotted. Uh, the sixth pearl value factor is nacre. Um, nacre quality is the condition of a pearl's nacreous surface. Uh, nacre quality is related to nacre layering during a pearl's growth and it affects luster surface thickness and durability. Uh, nacre layering may be tight or loose, thin or thick, intact or damaged. Uh, the GIA classifies nacre simply as acceptable or unacceptable. Acceptable indicates that the nacre quality and thickness meets general industry standards, while unacceptable, acceptable, sorry, indicates that the nacre layering is poor or thin, or that the nacre is damaged or otherwise compromised. Uh, the seventh and final pearl value factor is matching. Uh, matching describes the uniformity of pearls in a pair, group, strand, or jewelry item. Um, all of the previous six value factors are considered, as are some of the other um, features of pearls or pearl jewelry items, uh, such as graduation, blending, pearl placement, and drilling. Um, in some cases, certain categories, such as color or shape, may be intentionally mismatched as a design element. In such instances, matching can still be judged based on the other factors. Uh, for example, in a multicolor strand, consider if the tone, uh, saturation, and color placement within a strand are matched. Um, sometimes uh, you may look at a <clears throat> multicolor strand and think that it's sort of just random, but when you hold it up and sort of uh, close it up side to side, you'll see that the patterns um, match from side to side. So even though uh, it's a multicolored strand. Uh, it has been uh, carefully matched. Um, you can also have different hues uh, that are perfectly matched in terms of tone and saturation. Um, so you have to take those in, 
things into account and make sure that you are um, being observant when you're looking at uh, multicolored strands in particular. In some cases, there are intentionally no matching qualities. Um, in such instances, uh, matching may be designated as not applicable. Um, in certain older pieces of jewelry, they used to make little flower bouquets or, you know, a wagon carrying a bunch of pearls in it, and they would be all totally different, different colors, different sizes, different qualities. Um, and uh, there was no way to uh, connect them to each other and um, give it a matching classification. So in those cases, you can just say not applicable. Top end strands can take years and multiple harvests to complete. Due to the nuance of pearl colors and the complexity of matching them, it is much harder than it appears to produce perfectly matched strand of pearls. Uh, that said, lower end and even poor quality pearls can be well matched too. Um, so sometimes when you are grading um, or classifying matching uh, and the pearls are, let's say the luster's not great or the surface is uh, somewhat spotted, gemologists sometimes have a tendency to just uh, downgrade everything about the strand at hand uh, when you see those things. However, I have seen um, strands with uh, poor luster and moderate or heavy spotting, chalky uh, nacre be perfectly matched. So just because something is of poor quality doesn't mean that it cannot be well matched. So make sure that you're being observant again and that you are uh, judging the qualities that you're supposed to be judging on uh, themselves and not on the other characteristics. Um, although matching is the only non-inherent value factor, it can affect price significantly. Um, so the classification designations for matching are excellent, which is uniform in appearance and drilled on center. Very good. Uh, which is very minor variations in uniformity, good, uh, which are minor variations in uniformity, fair, which are noticeable variations in uniformity, and poor, which are very noticeable variations in uniformity. While laboratories may have access to extensive and expensive equipment and tools, uh, basic classification can be done in much simpler environments. For forming consistent elementary classification in a non-laboratory setting uh, simply requires pared down versions of the same elements used by gemologists in a laboratory setting. Creating a master set of pearls can be as simple as obtaining one short strand or even one pearl for each of the value factors. Those constant references should be representative of the pearl quality that you seek to buy, use, or sell. If you have even a single pearl, um, you can use that every time you buy pearls and you can know that what you're looking at or ultimately purchasing is equal to this pearl that you know uh, achieves the level of quality that you want or you can know that the pearls you're looking at are a little lower in quality or a little better. Um, so it just gives you a fixed point from which to work uh, without that um, master, be it a strand or a pearl, uh, you are relying on your memory, uh, which in cases like this is pretty faulty uh, and you will likely not end up with the results you want. While it is pre preferable for you to use your masters in a consistent environment, they may also be used when purchasing outside of your home base. Um, so you can bring it to shows or showrooms, um, anything really, auctions, uh, anything, anywhere where you would um, be uh, evaluating pearls. Uh, using a simple consistent observation uh, environment is another fundamental step in performing consistent classification. Uh, find or create an uncluttered space uh, with a neutral light and neutral background, preferably gray or white. 
Um, if you can create such a space in your studio or store or even at home, you want to try and use that space every time you classify pearls. Um, next, uh, establish a set routine for your classification. At GIA, we generally follow the order of the value factor list and we go size and shape and color, luster, surface, nacre, and finally matching. You do not have to follow that order, but following the same pattern each time makes uh, classification second nature and it decreases the chances of mistakes or omissions. So I highly recommend that if you are going to be doing pearl classification um, with any regularity, and even if you're doing it infrequently, try to always do it in the same order. Um, it makes it a lot easier. Um, and finally, while we'd love for you to use the uh, GIA Pearl Value Factors, <coughs> seven Pearl Value Factor uh, terminology, you may prefer your own class classification terms. The main thing is to be consistent in your usage. You do not want to use very good luster uh, one time and then uh, high luster the next time, as it may be difficult to remember how the two terms um, correspond to each other. Uh, is high luster equal to very good luster or is it equal to good luster? Um, it can be hard to remember uh, which is which. So, um, as you may have gleaned from the slide and from what I've been telling you, consistency is one of the uh, two key aims of any good classification system, and the other is uh, accuracy. <clears throat> but uh, consistency to me is uh, necessary um, for accuracy. So they both uh, sort of play off of each other. The GIA currently offers two PEARL services and reports. Um, the GIA PEARL identification report indicates whether PEARLs are natural or cultured, saltwater or freshwater, whether the species or mollusk type, uh, sorry, what the species or mollusk type is and whether any treatments have been detected. Uh, and the GIA PEARL identification and classification report provides all the same identification information as well as a detailed classification of the GIA seven pearl value factors for cultured Tahitian South Sea and Akoya pearls. In response to client inquiries and to address an underserved area of the pearl market, for the last two years, GIA has been developing something new. This new service will serve our clients who specialize in cultured pearls and seek GIA pearl classification services without pearl identification services. Today, you will all get the very first sneak peek at the upcoming new GIA Cultured Pearl Classification Report. This fall, the GIA in New York will introduce a brand new pearl service and report called the GIA Cultured Pearl Classification Report, pictured here. Uh, this will be a classification only report specifically and exclusively for cultured pearls. It will not include any identification testing or information. The GIA Cultured Pearl Classification Report will be a small format report like the Diamond Dossier, measuring in at just three by five inches when folded. Uh, despite its small size, this report will contain a detailed classification of each of the GIA seven pearl value factors, as well as a digital photograph of the report item. And like its small size, this report will come at a small price due to the elimination of the time consuming and more costly pearl identification testing. Uh, the GIA cultured pearl classification report is specifically for the primary types of cultured pearls. Initially, we will report on cultured Tahitian South Sea and Akoya pearls, and we expect to expand to cultured freshwater pearls uh, sometime next year. This report will not separate natural from cultured pearls, uh, saltwater from freshwater pearls, nor will it identify treatments or the mollusk types of client submitted pearls. Clients will state that their pearls are cultured and what the mollusk type is upon submission. We will not be testing that. So this is your first look at this report, which we uh, are looking to 
introduce um, in the very near future. Um, and hopefully uh, anyone who works in pearls and is watching um, will uh, order one and see, you know, how it works for them. And give us feedback, tell us if we need to make any improvements. Uh, and um, hopefully you all like it. In order to discuss and sort pearls in a useful and meaningful way, it is imperative that one employs a consistent method for evaluating, separating, and describing pearls to differentiate between their various appearances. The pearl industry needs ways to separate their harvests, identify the differences in lots, identify particular visual qualities for design, categorize their inventory, and retail customers need a way to understand the appearance and quality of the pearls they consider and ultimately purchase. The GIA seven pearl value factors pearl classification system is one that is unique and differs from other pearl classification systems in a number of ways. Using extensive type specific masters, separating the seven pearl value factors and using simple classification terminology produces a comprehensive pearl classification system that is accessible to all usual users <clears throat> within the pearl and jewelry industry and the public as well. Uh, all the photos used, or nearly all the photos used uh, in this talk were taken by Robert Weldon uh, for GIA. Thank you so much, Akira. This was all great information. We have a few questions about the report, so I think we can go ahead and start there since that was the last thing that we talked about. Sure. Uh, so, so somebody asked about a sample report. Uh, mm -hmm. We will have that on the website soon, um, mm -hmm. probably in the next few weeks, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, there were a few other questions too about the range of costs that should be all available on our website. But like Akira said, this new report is really the most affordable um, Pearl report. So that's an exciting new addition to the product family. Yeah. Um, and it's good for the current, you know, uh, financial and economical climate. Um, you know, we, we hope it'll be useful in that way, in that way. Yes, agreed. Uh, does the class, does the new report need to involve unmounted cultured pearls? Uh, yeah, it can be, they can be unmounted um, or mounted, um, either one. Uh, it okay. really, it's just that when, when things are mounted, then it is specific only to the, uh, to the part of the pearls that we can see because, you know, we can't say, oh, this is a clean pearl because this part that we see is clean and then you unmount it and the bottom of it is like jagged and chopped in half or something like that. So it can be either, but it's just treated slightly differently whether it's uh, loose or mounted. Great, so it's great that it at least has that flexibility. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into questions about how we grade pearls. So if a single pearl is drilled off center, what factor would that impact? Um, it depends on how it's being, uh, used. I mean, if it's, if it's off center on a, a ring or something like that, it doesn't really affect the quality of the pearl in terms of how we look at it. I mean, it won't look good on the ring perhaps, but, um, that's not really, um, an inherent value factor. Uh, for a single pearl. Um, if you had a strand of pearls and the drilling was off center on some of the pearls, then it will affect the, um, the matching uh, because the pearls may not sit straight. They might sit at angles or the, when they roll, they'll wobble. Um, but with an individual pearl, I don't think it would really necessarily affect uh, agreed. Great. It's good to know. Uh, how do we determine nacre thickness? Um, nacre thickness is examined using x-ray. Um, you know, in the past we had, um, actually measured nacre thickness in some cases when the clients requested it. Um, we don't, um, measure it very often. It's not something that people ask for very often, 
but when gemologists are doing identification uh, services, they um, are looking at nacre thickness, um, you know, the whole time while they're uh, x-raying pearls. And if they have, you know, a decent amount of pearl experience, they can sort of tell right away if um, something looks a little too thin. Um, and generally, uh, most pearls are um, the right thickness. You know, they, uh, they're they acceptable in terms of how thick they are and the quality of the um, nacre. So um, when there's something that's a problem, too thin, damaged, or something like that, then uh, a gemologist who's examining the pearl would make a note of it. Okay, great. Uh, can you explain some of the common pearl enhancement treatments? And how does GI identify those, or how does that show up on a GI pearl report? Um, yeah, I mean, identification uh, treatments are um, part of the identification service, not the classification service. Um, so that you would have to get an identification report in order to um, to detect treatments. Um, superficial treatments would be things like dye. Um, or shaping. Sometimes if you have a large pearl um, that um, for whatever reason, maybe it's got an ugly edge or maybe they're trying to fit it into something, they'll um, change the shape of the pearl. They'll make it a button shape by flattening out a bottom or they'll make it oval shaped by sort of grinding away the edges. Um, so that's a type of treatment um, that is applied to the surface. Um, there are other like chemical enhancements that are used um, to uh, enhance luster. Um, you can bleach pearls to make them look more white. Um, there's a lot of different things that can be done to pearls. Okay, and those, those are all reported in our identification reports. Yeah, if you have any suspicion that your pearls are treated in some way, then you have to get a pearl identification report um, to get those results. Um, yeah, right. the classification right. report won't tell you any information about that at all. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Uh, are cultured pearls and natural pearls graded using the same seven pearl value factor system? Well, we don't um, issue classification reports for natural pearls. Um, they are um, very rare um, these days because we're, you know, we've essentially scooped them all up and used them all up. Uh, so most of the natural pearls in the market are um, uh, old, they're antiques um, and you know, because of that, some of them are in not great condition, um, but they are, um, you know, some of the most rare gems in some ways because they don't replenish like other um, colored stones uh, can replenish, you know, or you may find a new mine or whatever. Um, uh, natural pearls are a much more, or were a much more limited resource. I mean, we can still find natural pearls around the world, but not to a degree that it would impact the pearl market. You know, we're not going to stumble across a lost, uh, you know, lagoon full of thousands and thousands of pearls uh, in a way that will affect the pearl market. Um, oh, so, but wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> it would be nice. <laughs> Okay, so we're just about out of time. Uh, I just wanted to mention there were a few questions too about getting access to some of this printed material. material. Um, you know, more information about the seven pearl value factors. We do actually have brochures that are available on our store. So if you go to store.gi.edu, you can buy brochures that you can use at the counter um, that give you a really great overview. And, uh, you know, Akira and I will get together after this and figure out if there are any good G and G articles that we might be able to include, uh, mm -hmm. that will point you in the right direction for more information about hue wheels and the scale, since I think that those were some common questions too. So we'll yeah. include links to those articles in the email we send out later today. Yeah. So that's just about it. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks for all the great questions. If you have any other questions that we didn't get to, please find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for Akira for taking the time and join us next week where we'll be joined by Dr. Mike Breeding, who's gonna give us an 
in-depth look at natural green diamonds, which will be very exciting. So see you all next week.